Okay, this is the second in the series tonight on the series of the four faces of the sons of God. The four faces of the sons of God, or four profiles of God's people in the end times. And um, last week we began looking at this um, from Ezekiel chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, come across to Ezekiel chapter 1. In that first chapter, it um, speaks of a angelic beings which portray the four faces of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the four profiles of Jesus, which also are the four profiles of the sons of God. We also find them in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. The same um, angelic creature is described there again. But in Ezekiel chapter 1, Verse 5 says, And also out of the midst there came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. Verse 10, And as for the likeness of their faces, the four had the faces of a man, the faces of a li- face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four had also the face of an eagle. Okay, the same description is found in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. Last week we began by looking at the profile um, of the eagle. The um, four faces of Jesus, he's portrayed as an eagle. He's now also portrayed, portrayed as a lion, a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's portrayed as an ox. And he's portrayed as a man. These are characteristics of God's people in the end time. They are profiles uh, or characteristics of what God is seeking to work within us in these last days. Does that sound a little light out there? Just drop it back a little. Okay. Last week we looked at the eagle. And we class the two, two birds are classed in scripture together. One is the eagle and the other is the chicken. And, um, and so we looked at that through scripture and you can choose whatever you want to be in God. And, uh, we looked about the eagle, the vision of the eagle, the, uh, fact that the eagle can rise effortlessly into the realms of the spirit, into the heavenly realms. Um, we looked at all of that kind of thing. The eagle can kill very, very quickly. And when the storm breaks, he is in his element. And so tonight we're going to go on. And I want to talk to the next profile. The profile of one of these creatures was that of a man, the face of a man. Ezekiel 5, 1 and verse 5, in fact, tells us that it's it's not only the faces of a man, but um, the likeness of a man. So man is predominant, if you like, in this portrayal. In verse 5 of Ezekiel, one out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And so the predominant uh, profile, the predominant feature was that of a man. The uh, man, and as a man, he has also the nature of an eagle. As a man, he has also the nature of an ox. And as a man, he has also the nature of a lion. And um, the natures of an eagle and ox and a lion function um, with an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Those characteristics come forth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but he is always a man. Whether there is an anointing or not, the man is still the man. The, the aspects, there's three aspects which the man portrays, such as the eagle, the lion and the ox, require an anointing for them to operate. But he continues to um, remain a man. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it tells us that man was created in the image and in the likeness of God. And there's a twofold statement there in Genesis 1, 27. He was created that way in the image and in the likeness of God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created him. The lady you'll find says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, 
and let them have dominion. Dominion over the works of God's hand, his creation. Man created in the image of God. The image there is a Hebrew word which donates or uses the term for a physical form. Created in the image of God, in a physical likeness, a physical form. Um, physical form, created in the image, physically like God. That's a Hebrew word which is very, very clear. And then he's made in the likeness of God, not just the image of God, but the likeness of God. The Hebrew word is damuth, which is means patterned after the original. It's a very strong Hebrew word, which very clearly means patterned after the original. So man was patterned, made and patterned after the original. Now who was the original? Obviously it was God. God, we were, man was made in the image and the likeness of God. The likeness patterned after the original, more than just physical. It denotes um, emotional, uh, intellectual, spiritual. It's not just a physical likeness, but it's the whole of what God is like. His whole nature. Um, not just an outward physical form or outward physical shape, but patterned after the original, internally and externally. And uh, so man was made in the image, looks like God, in the image of God physically, and in the likeness of God patterned after the original. So you say, what does God look like? Well, he looks like you. That's good enough. God looks like you. You were patterned after the original. That's what God originally looked like. Man is not just, see, we have a great problem with evolution when it comes to the scripture because of the overall philosophy, the overall concept of the purposes of God for man. He was made in the image and the likeness of God with a high destiny. But, and it cuts right across the whole evolutionary statements. Now, evolution would, would tell us just the opposites of that, that man wasn't created in the image and the likeness of God. He has no purpose. He has no destiny. He, um, uh, he is originated by chance. Okay, some chemical accident by chance. And therefore cannot have any destiny, cannot have any noble or high calling. And so the whole of the evolutionary tract takes man that way. But the scripture tells us that man was made in the image and the likeness of God. In the beginning, um, God created man. The Hebrew word there, man, is the word which in the Hebrew means Adam. He created Adam. He created a man in his image and his likeness. And uh, a little later, David was to ask the question in one of the Psalms, in the 8th Psalm, he asked the question, what is man that God is so interested in him? In Psalm 8 and verses uh, 6 or 4 to 6, the 8th Psalm, verse 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visitest him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor, and you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. A very interesting statement about man. What is man that thou art mindful of him, son of man that thou visitest him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels. That word angels is the word Elohim. And the translators couldn't kind of handle that, so they put Elohim as a name for God. Literally reads, God made man just a little lower than God. When the translators came along, they said they couldn't handle that, so they put angels in there. But the original Hebrew is Elohim. And that's a name, a reference to God. So we are made just a little lower than God and crowned with glory and honor. What does that mean? It says he crowned him with glory and honor. The word glory there is the Hebrew word kabod, which means a quantity of all, a quantity of wealth, power and position, possessing all things with the emphasis on quantity. It's a word sometimes used for glory in other references, but the crown him with a quantity of all that God is, with reference and the emphasis on quantity, possessing all things. So we have the concept that he is an heir. Man is created as the heir of God. And as the heir, 
possessing all things that God is and has. What is man that thou hast made, that thou art mindful of him? You made him to have dominion over the entire works of your hands. Not just on planet earth, of the entire works of your hands. Universal. And the statement is very, very clear. Uh, crown him with glory, quantity of everything that God is, of wealth, power, position, possessing all things. Crown him with that, an heir of God, and crown him with honor. The Hebrew word for honor is heda, and uh, it means um, physically attractive. Isn't that good? Crown you with honor. And also, it has the thought that, that Hebrew word heda of rank. Um, Social position in the universe has a, it's a Hebrew word which was used literally for social position, uh, or rank in the purposes of a, of a Jewish structure. And God now using the same language, he says, God has crowned us with glory, but not only that, he's crowned the man, the human race, man with honor. Physically attractive, like God, with great rank, um, and position in the universe. You see, manhood is the most noble thing in the universe, for man is godlike. Now, when we refer to man, we're talking about both gender, male and female, but I can't keep saying that all night, so we say man in the, means ladies, okay? Both gender. But um, manhood is the most noble thing in the entire universe. We were made like God. Now, we've got to appreciate that if we really come to an understanding of man's position, his purpose for creation, what God has made him, he is like God, we begin to get something of an understanding of the purposes of God for our lives. We are made um, just like him, a tr tremendous place in the economy and the purposes of God. In Psalm 82, in verse 6, it reads like this, Psalm 82, 6, it says, I have said, you are God's. And all of you are children of the Most High. What was he saying? In the inspired words. He said, I have said that ye are gods. And uh, you are children of the Most High. But he said, you shall die like men. Now that word men there in Hebrew is a word that is used for depraved man. Depraved manhood. You will die just like a depraved specimen of the human race because he was chastising them but he, he used that kind of terminology I have said that you are gods and all of you are the children of the most high incredible statement Jesus quoted that scripture um, in the New Testament in the gospel of John and um, in chapter 10 he uses the same, the same verse he uses that scripture that's kind of verifying it in John 10 and verses 34 and 35. Jesus used the same scripture. Um, Jesus answered them, It is not written on the law, I said, Ye are gods. And if, called, if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said... I said, ye are gods. Okay, he's talking about the man. He's talking about the position of man. And we need to understand this. Manhood is a very noble thing. Now we know it's been spoiled. But in the purposes of God, when Adam stood in the Garden of Eden, he stood as a representative of God. Made in the image and the likeness of God, perfect in every way, God gave him the entire earth. It was Adam's. He said, have dominion over the works of my hand. He gave him one planet initially, planet earth. And he said, I want you to bring heaven to earth, extend, extend my kingdom into the earth. You are my son. Now, bring the kingdom into the earth. You are like me in the universe. Establish my kingdom in the earth. Now, even angels don't have the kind of rank, position, glory, and honor 
that man has. Now there's some pretty uh, powerful angels in the angelic kingdom, but if you come across to the book of Hebrews, um, very, very clearly in the book of Hebrews, it re refers to the angelic realm in relationship to man and his position. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 it says, How shall we escape if we neglect the greater salvation? Okay, how shall we escape? Speaking of a great salvation. And then verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, but, he's given them to man, but in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels, or Elohim God, crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of your hands. Okay, now that's the third time through the scripture that this reference has come up. When God created Adam and Eve, he said, This is your role. I've given you dominion, have dominion. Then it's re recorded in the Psalms again. Now we come across into the New Testament. And uh, he is saying that the angels don't have the role and the call and the destiny that man has. The angels don't have that rank. They don't have that position. They don't have that honor. They don't have that glory. No matter how powerful those angels are, the secondary to man. He didn't say that the angels have this, for unto the angels he is not put in subjection in the world to come whereof we speak, but in a certain place, what is man? He's talking about man. We need to understand, to be human is godly. You know, we have this saying, well, I'm only human. We always use it in a kind of negative sense, in the fallen nature sense. You, and we kind of excuse ourselves by saying, you know, well, well you know, I'm only human. To be human is godlike. So you're going to use that in future, remember that. If you say, I'm only human, you can say, I'm only godlike. That didn't give you a very good excuse, does it? So, um, next time you hit your thumb with a hammer when you're driving a nail in the wall, say, I'm only godlike. I don't complain. And uh, to be godlike, is to, to be human, is godly. A redeemed human being is an incredible creation. Godly in mind, emotion, and will, physically, he is creative, he is godlike. That's the human race, that's redeemed man. And uh, God made man in the beginning, the highest role, the highest rank in the whole of God's creation. Stood, powerful, noble, a representative of God, an extension of God's family into the earth, to extend God's kingdom. And he had that rank, he had that glory, he had possessed the whole earth. And so we can understand that the fall, when Adam sinned and Adam fell, the fall was a massive blow to the purposes of God. It's not that God didn't foresee it, he did. But with man has a free will. And the fall, the degeneration of man through the fall, was a massive blow. Sin, and generations of sin, and generations of fellowship with the satanic realm changed the image of man. Changed the nature of man. And he fell. Now there was a problem. Because he was still man, he still had glory, he still had honor, he was still made in the image and the likeness of God, he still had God-like natures and qualities there. And through the fall, you find that man misused his God-like qualities, his position, and his authority. It was a misuse. He still had... Remember when, when Lucifer fell? Remember, he still had power. He still had creative power. He still had authority. He changed sides, but he still had authority and power. He still had those qualities which God created him with. He still was a very powerful fallen archangel. He was powerful before he fell, and he was powerful after he fell. Because he still had those God-given powers and, and authority working with him, and creative abilities. So it is with man. 
when man fell, he was created in the image and likeness of God with tremendous authority, tremendous rank, and he fell. Okay, and then there came the misuse of his godlike qualities. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, you know, it didn't take very long. In Genesis chapter 6, not too long after the, the fall of man and then the fall of the human race through the first man, Adam, it says in Genesis 6 and verse 5 and 6, it reads like this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And it repented God that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Didn't take long before every imagination of his heart was wicked. Can you imagine a, a powerful, influential being on the wrong side? had great power, great qualities, godlike qualities, but could be misused for evil, creative abilities, like God, highest rank in the universe, and now he switches sides. And it says that it wasn't long before God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And repented God that he had made him on the face of the earth. Because he had God-like abilities and powers, his potential for great and good was tremendous. But also his potential for great evil was tremendous as well. So man, God took an incredible risk creating man in his image and his likeness. When the fall came, still in the image and the likeness of God, still with that rank, still with that position, man stood with the um, God-like powers and abilities and qualities and had the potential for great good because he was God-like. But on the other side, he was also the potential for great evil because he was, had those powers and qualities. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6, it reads like this, a little further down the track, in Genesis 11, at verse 6 of the Tower of Babel, it says, and, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And as they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Nothing shall be impossible. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So potent, so powerful was the human being, the human race, that nothing would be impossible to them, he said. Anything that they imagined, anything they set their hand to do, they could do it. And God says, I've got to restrict this this spread, this potential for evil in the earth, I have to restrict it. So he did it two ways. He confused the languages. And he spread them across the face of the earth. Isolated them. And so he retarded the spread of evil in the earth. He retarded this race, the human race, which had gone to the other side. He retarded their spread through the earth. They couldn't get together like they could at the Tower of Babel because he said... Nothing that they can imagine is restricted from them. They'll be able to do it. Because, he said, you are gods. In the creation of God in the universe, they were gods. They had God-like attributes, qualities, and powers for good or evil. And so it was all on. Great power for good, great power for evil. Lucifer had great qualities also. Not as much as man. He had great qualities, great power stood before God. And when he fell, we see how he ended up. But he was still with power. See, the fall was a great tragedy. You can see, look what the human race has done to the world. I mean, they have literally ruined this planet. It was fantastic in the beginning, but the human race has just ruined it. They've cut a great swath 
um, of devastation through history. History of the human race is terrible. It's rotten. There's nothing good about it anywhere. It's just devastation everywhere. And uh, the fall is a great, great tragedy. And um, history is tragic. They have a power to destroy a whole planet. They allowed Satan to become the god of this world. It was man that allowed that, not God. Adam handed the whole title deed of the earth over to Satan. It was Adam. God gave it to him. Adam handed it to Lucifer. That's why he's, he's said as the God of this world, this world's systems. The earth belongs to God, but he is the God of this world. Satan is the God of this world, the world's systems. And it was a tremendous tragedy, the, the fall of the human race. It has set up the tremendous evil and the problems in the world today. Man has great capacity for evil because he's made in the image and the likeness of God. So he's virtually just about destroyed this planet. When the, the original assignment was to Adam to multiply, bring heaven to earth, establish the kingdom of God in the earth, it was an incredible creation. The earth. Beautiful, incredible place. And man has systematically destroyed it. So you cannot blame the devil. If only likes to blame the devil. The devil hasn't destroyed this world. Man has. Sure, the devil is in power. But man, with his will and with his choice, has destroyed the planet in which we live. Not Satan. Man gave Satan an advantage, but it was man who sold the whole thing out. Now, when we read in Hebrews chapter 2, Paul the Apostle speaks of um, so great a salvation. He's talking about man and his purpose in the earth. Uh, his noble calling made him made to have dominion in the earth uh, over the works of his hands and so on. And then he begins to point out in the, in uh, Hebrews chapter two and verse three, how shall we escape? But this little verse, so great a salvation, so great a salvation. See, redemption, redemption is simply to restore man back to his original state. Through the fall, through sin, through generations of sin, worshipping of evil spirits and idolatry, the hereditary factors, both genetically, naturally genetic and spiritually genetic, set up in the human race, has marred the human race. We come to the Lord, there's a great salvation, redemption, there's the first place, forgiveness of sin, the operation of the Holy Spirit within our lives to restore, to restore. Every outpouring of the Holy Spirit has one thing in mind, to restore, try to get the human race back to its original, back to its perfection, to restore them back to the original state, the original image of glory and honor. And when we we're talking about this, this concept of um, restoration, when Paul was speaking about the, the operations of the Holy Spirit and the word of God in people's lives to bring them back it, it, in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, it says the whole objective is to, is to bring them back to a perfect man. To a perfect man. Ephesians 4. And uh, it says, verse 11, God gave these ministries, verse 12, for the perfecting of God's people. Okay? Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to that perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, coming back to that perfect man. And so God's purpose for man is for him to be crowned with glory and honor. To be human is godly. To be human is to be God-like, to be like God. The redeemed human being. To bring him back to that what? That perfect man. When Paul was writing to the church at Rome, he put it differently in Romans chapter 8 verse 29. He said that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. Conformed back in Romans 8 and verse 29 to the image of Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son 
that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn of many just like him. That Jesus, he, the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren, conformed, you see, um, to the image of Jesus. Paul the Apostle, when writing again to the uh, Ephesian church, he describes this redemptive process, the redemption of the human race, um, in verse 15, Ephesians 2.15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that's between us and God, to make in himself one new man. One new man. Living creatures had the face of a man. Sure, they had the face of an eagle, they had the face of an ox, they had the face of a lion, but predominantly, he was a man. He had all of these other attributes which were necessary, but predominantly, he was a man. Our humanity is very, very important to God because it is God-like. Not the fallen side of the human race, but the redeemed side of the human race we're talking about now. He had the face of a man. Man is central in the creation of God and in the purposes of God. The face of a man with the nature or the profile of an eagle, an ox and a lion. But essentially, a man. A man who is like God. He said, no you're not, that you are God's. No, you're not that you were made just a little lower than God. Jesus was the firstborn of many. He was the Son of God. He was God made flesh. He was the firstborn of many who would come just like Him, would become just like Him. Jesus was human. He was the firstborn of many, many that would come into the earth in these end times just and be just like Him. If you have your Bibles, come across to First John, the epistles um, of First John, and um, <clears throat> we just read a few verses from that. In First John, chapter three, verse two, beloved, now are we the sons of God. The the word sons of God there is a the Greek word techno. Now are we, and it's a word that's used for children. Now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, and that's not the second coming, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. When he appear, we shall be like him. The human race, the man, like God. In First John chapter 5 and verse 1 it says whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God born of God's seed born of God next of kin you say when you're born in the natural who's your next of kin you say well your parents who's your next of kin as a Christian God born of God See, the human race is not just something which God decided to create. It was something that came out from him. In the image and likeness of God. Another one of him. Part of the family of God. God will always remain supreme, but he has a family. He has children. He has those who are like him. In fact, born of God. In 1 John uh 3 and verse 9, it puts it a little clearer. It says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. That's the life of God within us. The new life within us cannot sin. Your old nature can sin, but that new life, that nature, you, the real you, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed that word seed in the Greek is the word for sperm. God's sperm, his seed, remains in us. You see, born of God. But not just some abstract creation of God. 
We came out from Him. His seed remains within us. We are related, directly related to God as sons, children of God. We have a spirit. God is a spirit. The animal creation was much lower. The animal creation doesn't have a spirit. It has a soul. It's pre-programmed. We call it instinct. But man has a spirit. He has a thinking spirit. Now his brain is just a computer, but he has a thinking spirit that works with his computer up here. He is different to the animal race altogether. He is like God. He is of God. He's a new species. The God-men in the earth. Know ye not that you are gods? Ye are the God-men, the God-women in the earth. One with God. In John chapter 17, we have a scripture which is often misconstrued. Um... In John 17, verse 21, it reads like this. It says, For they all may be one, he's praying that we all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in the, you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me. That they, they may be perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and have loved them, thou hast loved me. Now this scripture is often used, you know, we've got to be one with each other. When the church is one together, the world will know. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that when we are one with God, Nothing to do with each other. It's t talking about when we are one with God. Very clearly, context, it says here, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they may be one in us. That's in the Godhead, that the world might believe. And then the glory which thou gavest me, I've given to them. I in them, and they, them in me, that they may be made perfect. There is a oneness, you see, there is a relationship. There is a oneness with God. I think God gets really disappointed when people, human beings, begin to run themselves down. You know, I'm nothing and you are something. In God, you are everything. You're the highest ranking creation in the universe. You are something. You're made in the image and the likeness of God. You have God's seed in you. You have God's spirit in you. You have God-like qualities and abilities and creative abilities. You have the potential for incredible good and incredible evil. You know, when a Christian goes wrong, gets in the occult, they really get into it because they know what they're doing. And they have potential for incredible evil. But you have the potential for incredible good, incredible power. A new species in the earth, the God-man. In Christ you are all things crowned with glory and honor. This is the basis of our victory, our strength and our power. You know, Philippians 4 and verse 13 says, Through Christ who strengtheneth me, we can do all things. Now, all of God's working in us are to bring us to this end. To perfect us, to restore us. So that we stand as a man, like God, or like Jesus, who is a man, in the earth. With power, and authority, and rank, and dignity, and ability, and creative powers. To subdue this earth. And God's going to have a company of people in these last days. The Bible refers to them as the sons of God. They're going to take back this earth and subdue it bring down evil and bring in a whole new reign of Christ in the earth. God's purpose for planet earth hasn't changed. Adam fouled it up. Hasn't changed. 6,000 years is not much to God. She's to blink and it's gone. To us it's a long time. His purposes haven't changed. Adam, be fruitful, multiply. Take dominion of the earth, fill it with God. Okay? We had a hitch. So Jesus had to come and die to restore back the human race. Okay, that's not just to get you to heaven. 
You know, for years, the kind of mentality the church has was come to Jesus, be saved, so you'll go to heaven. Big deal. That's not what it's all about at all. God says, what about the earth? That's what it's all about. Not to get you to heaven. In fact, these end time Christians are not going to spend much time in heaven. They're going to spend most of their time on the earth. And, uh, that's it. There's a thousand reign of, you know, a thousand year reign of Christ coming. And, uh, we're not interested in heaven. We're interested in bringing heaven to earth. Now, if you die and go to heaven, there is a heaven. I believe in heaven. All that. Don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. There is a heaven. It's a wonderful place. It's great. But that's not what we're destined for. Okay? Heaven is just a waiting place. You know, those who died a few generations back or before the time when the earth was restored, they're uh, being held in heaven. Okay? Well, I mean, it's a nice place to hold them. But that's not the purposes of God. The purposes of God is to take this universe and establish his kingdom throughout the universe. And in the end, heaven's going to come to earth anyway. So there you got it. The earth is God's purpose. That's where the whole thing is. In, is God's interest is in the earth. Sure. The devil is going to fight for this earth because Adam handed it to him. There's going to be an incredible conflict with the Antichrist in these last days for the earth. One world government controlling the earth. But praise God. God's going to have a people called the face of a man. That the qualities of an eagle, qualities of an ox, a lion-like character, who are going to take this earth back for God. And God waits until his enemies are subjugated under the hand and under the feet of his own creation, man. We've had the kind of mentality that we've got to hang on and wait for God to come and save us. Well, he's not going to come and save us. I've got news for you. He's not going to come and save us. You say, well, before it gets hard in the earth and tribulation comes, God's going to save us. No, no. God's people cause the tribulation. Tribulation is just the final battle for who's in control. That's all it is. If he takes you out, then the devil can say, oh boy, you know, these people have got it easy. They don't have no right to own anything. When the rub got, got rough, you just lifted them out to heaven. God says, no, I didn't. I left them in the earth and they fought you and overcame you and subdued the earth and won. Now the earth is mine. And I'm going to reign and rule for a thousand years. Hallelujah. A thousand years is just a practice run for the ongoing purposes out into the universe. There are other planets, there are other places out there. God continues to go. God continues to create. It's an ongoing thing. And we're just in training to take the administrative role of the God through, with the Godhead for the ages to come out throughout the universe in the kingdom of God. Man. What is man? He had the face of a man. And all of God's workings in us are to this end, to restore us back to our manhood, our womanhood in God, so that we can stand noble, like God, part of his family, in the earth, mature. All of God's workings are towards this end. In Hebrews 2, and verse, again, coming back to 5, he said, The angels don't have this rank, they don't have this place. But in a certain place, what is man that thou art made mindful of him? You made him a little lower than God, crowned him with glory and honor, to set him over the works of your hand. Now it says this, now listen. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Verse 8. Okay, through the cross... God is exalted in man. We're born of the Spirit again. All things are under our feet. Positionally, he has paid the price. We have that authority. So now, that's a statement that very clearly is made. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And then it goes on. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Very clear. Everything is under him. The feet of the people of God. The child of God. But he says this, But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, okay, who was made a little lower 
then God Elohim for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things listen in bringing many sons to glory it seems like a contrary statement you put all things under his feet but now we see not yet all things put under him See, we're in a progression of coming into manhood. We're in a progression. Legally, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus won the battle and handed us back the earth. He put all things back under our feet, like he did with Adam. He said, you have dominion over all the works of my hands. Now Jesus said, I put all things back under your feet. But the devil's still running loose out there causing havoc, all kinds of things are happening out there. So he says, I don't see yet everything put under your feet. It's a progression. It's a progression of light, revelation, understanding as to the calling and the purpose of man until finally this last generation on the face of the earth will fulfill that scripture and put all things under their feet, literally. It will become a reality. And the sons of God will stand in these last days Redeemed, restored, whole, healed, crowned with glory and honor. The aristocracy of God's creation destined to rule and reign with God in the ages to come. With the face of a man. With the attributes of a lion, an ox and an eagle. To rule and to reign with Christ. That is your destiny as a human being. That is the purposes of God for your life. Not just to eke out an existence in this life, but to rise as sons of God. You are in training. Every experience, every pressure, every hardship, every trouble, every conflict you face is designed. God will use it to train you to stand as a man. Godlike. In these last days, and to overcome. And to take back dominion of this earth, and to begin to rule and reign with God. What is man? We haven't begun to understand what man is, and his incredible potential in the purposes of God. And God has redeemed us, Brought us back after the fall, healing us, restoring us, every area of our life, body, soul, and spirit, so that we can stand as a man or woman in these last days, representing God in the earth. Like God, his sperm, born of him, likeness of God, in the image of God, with the qualities of God, the power of God, the characteristics of God, the creative abilities of God, sons of God in the earth. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. A man, the face of an iron, the character of an ox, the power of an eagle, Four profiles, four facets, four faces of God's people in these last days is where God wants to bring us to until we learn to rule and reign with Him. And then those people will rule with Him through the millennium, gain some more experience, and then the ongoing purposes of God into the universe. And the extension of His kingdom, the Bible says, there is no end to it. Let's just pray tonight. Father, I pray tonight that by the operation of your Spirit within our hearts, Lord, that you will give us a real understanding and enlightened hearts, enlightened intellect understanding the purposes of God for the human race. Why we are here 
To be human is to be God-like. Lord, you're never going to take away our humanity. Through the ages to come, sure we'll be clothed in another body, in a resurrection body, but we'll be human. We'll be human beings. We'll be men and women. And it will never change. We'll always be men. Will always be human, noble, upright, the species of God. Glory and honor, highest rank in the universe, the extension of God's family. Father, I pray tonight that by the operation of the Holy Spirit we may begin to see by revelation what is man, what we are in Christ and what we are destined for. We are destined for the throne of the universe as a bride or a helpmeet to rule and reign with you in the ages to come. And the history of the world and the short span of man of 6,000 years is nothing to you, Lord. It's just a trial period. Adam's sin was just a hitch in the program of God. That you've redeemed again the human race to bring us back to our original stance and our original purpose. It mean we might lift our heads high in our abilities in God. We inherit them from God. Nothing of ourselves, but spiritually his genes are in us and we are like God. And as a man and as a woman, you're developing qualities of the ego, the ox and the lion, qualities to rule and reign with, qualities to serve with, qualities to be sons of God.